Hello, everyone. Welcome to Nova Southeastern University's South Florida Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program podcast, also known as the SFGWEP podcast. We are here today to educate, encourage, and enhance our knowledge and skills and promote all those amazing health professional experts working with the elderly, including caregivers and interprofessional teams. My name is Dr. Vincent Guida, and I am Associate Professor in the Department of Geriatrics at Karan C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine at Nova Southeastern University. And in today's episode, we are taking an in-depth look at Alzheimer's disease. Joe Baldelamar is a bilingual program manager for the Alzheimer's Association of Florida. Joe earned an MS in neuropsychology from Boston College, along with a foundation degree in philosophy and theology from Boston College's School of Theology and Ministry. Mr. Baldelamar is one of two brain bus program managers bringing awareness about brain health to the community across Florida. He is also one of three research champions in Florida. In this role, he specializes in providing education about the advancements in Alzheimer's disease and dementia science. He has presented online and in person to thousands of individuals, including the general public, families impacted by Alzheimer's disease, and professionals. He covers topics related to the brain and caregiving, such as diagnosis, mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's, and related dementia, disaster preparedness, communication, and behavioral issues. Welcome, Joe. It's a pleasure to welcome you to our podcast, and I wanted to thank you for your time and expertise. Thank you so much, Dr. Gita. Can we start by you telling us why this topic is so important to you? So when it comes to Alzheimer's and other dementias, it's very important because if we look at statistics, especially here in Florida, by the year 2050, if we're looking at those statistics, the increase in cases will rise to 24.5 from almost 560,000 people suffering from the disease in the state. This is here in Florida. And then the importance of being aware about early detection, in what we're doing is trying to go to rural areas to provide this information to underserved communities. And we also have a big campaign regarding awareness amongst the LGBTQ plus community. Excellent. Tell us a little bit about the Brain Bus Program. Absolutely. So the Brain Bus Program is a uh, program that we have two mobile units. One is an RV and the other one is a van. And we usually go across the state. So same thing to provide information, awareness, uh, early detection. We speak a lot about the 10 warning signs, 10 ways of how to love your brain a little bit about what the mind diet is, and we provide resources, and we try to connect people within resources within the community. You mentioned the 10 warning signs. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. You know, one of the things that we carry in the van is actually a, uh, a little cut car, which have all the 10 warning signs, and we usually try to explain people that not every single person is going to experience the signs one, two, three, four, in that order. Some people, you know, they will start experiencing some different things, while others don't even show signs until they're very advanced in stage. So we usually start with the memory issues that actually disrupt everyday life. That's when we tell people you start worrying, not like if you forget your keys or you misplace something, and if you're still able to backtrack and find those objects or whatever was misplaced, then, you know, should be no issues. But when they start affecting your daily life, that's what we worry. So we have all this educational program at the two warning signs. You know, some of them are like trouble understanding visual images, problems with words, speaking, uh, decrease or poor judgment, and things like that. So we go through the whole listing. We hear a lot about the early diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's disease. I know that some of the focus and treatments and the disappointment in those treatments are felt to be related to the fact that we're intervening well into the disease, into the disease. Can you tell us a little bit about early diagnosis? When it comes to early diagnosis, we start seeing uh, through research that sometimes the development of the disease itself can start 20 years before 
even is diagnosed. So what we encourage people is when they start having any type of issues that they start observing that it's not normal for them to start experiencing these issues with memory. It says, you know, go, go see your primary care practitioner, talk to them that they may they can do a, a quick mini cognitive test, and if necessary, refer you to see a neurologist because lately we're finding that people might have uh, what is called the mild cognitive impairment. And when that is detected earlier, on an earlier stage, it might be treatable. So that will provide the person an elongated life where they still be aware and be able to make decisions and things like that. So that's what we push so much about early diagnosis. That sounds like a very significant point. Can we get back to the brain bus and rural areas? Tell us about digital gaps. That's a, a term I've seen uh, used. <laughs> yes. So the digital gap, just to give an idea, I went to this senior center uh, in Mayo, Florida. And it was interesting to see that there was only one computer in the center and it was powered by a hotspot because there was no internet access. So as I'm doing a presentation at the end, I have a QR code for people to scan and say, you know, give us your feedback. And when I pull it apart, everybody's looking at me like, what he's talking about? Like, yeah. what is that? So I tried to explain what it was, and then I start asking people, so you know, how you usually get your information? So it's either through TV, radio, or newspapers. There was even a couple of people that have no idea what the internet was. And to me, that was like, you know, we're talking about 2023 here in the United States. Uh, so I was like <laughs> surprised and I don't even know what to tell. Like my reaction was just like, wow. So we're, we're trying to close that down, like you know, trying to see other ways on how we can actually provide this information. So we usually encourage people to call us because when they call our headline desk, they can actually talk to a master level clinician and actually receive that information home. Uh, that sounds like a great resource. It's amazing that Florida has those areas. It's a large state with large rural areas, so I guess we should not be surprised. But it sounds like the brain bus certainly serves a great purpose. The brain bus is a way to provide more inclusive education. What other things can we do to provide more inclusive education? To be more inclusive in the state of Florida, we have to understand the dynamics of what makes the communities in our state, right? We have rural areas. If you look at the state of Florida, there are 17 rural counties. In those rural counties, there is a lot of migrant workers. They might don't speak the language. Even though that I'm bilingual, sometimes they might don't even speak Spanish. They might speak indigenous languages. So one of the things that when we talk to people is trying to let them know that when you have information, make sure that you at least translate into the most spoken language in those areas. So that way people have the access to see the resources that are available and just to be aware of all the different dynamics because as I mentioned, as our population keeps growing and also our aging population keeps growing in the state of Florida, rural communities has doubled as far as you know the aging population and uh, the places that I have visited uh, the only resource that they have for immediate access it will be like the hubs from the Department of Health which are usually clinics that might be open one day for geriatrics one day for pediatrics one day for odontology you know it's, it's a uh, very difficult to actually have the access the immediate access for somebody that might have been experiencing memory issues the resources might they will tell them you know you need to go, go to the next big city to get treated or to get a diagnosis some people will completely eliminate so trying to incorporate all the organizations that we work with churches community centers even with the department of elderly affairs the department of health universities trying to encompass all those groups to understand these dynamics i think it will help a lot in uh, having some sort of way of helping people in these communities. Definitely increasing the, the reach of Alzheimer's education. There's a segment of the geriatric population that's often forgotten, it, and that's the LGBTQ community. Could you talk a little bit about the outreach to that community? Of course. So LGBTQ plus community dynamics are very interesting because it takes time to build trust. 
in the community uh, and it's just because historically lack of access to medical services, uh, discrimination, somehow we see a lot of discrimination where uh, loved ones are trying to move into living assistance facilities uh, just because of the stigma of being gay or lesbian. And what we're trying to do is in these particular facilities, these other areas, to give this type of uh, sensory training so people are aware of circumstances and be more open to actually welcome people. And also, you know, working a lot with the Pride Center, for example. It took me years to actually be able to present and, and talk to people but because, you know, they're very reluctant to allow other places to come in because you never know what information you're going to get. But for them just to be aware of all the resources that are available, I think it has made a big impact in the community. It sounds like that's uh, been a real challenge, but it's good to hear that uh, inroads are made, uh, being made into educating, uh, offering education regarding Alzheimer's disease to that community. You know, one of the purposes of the GWEP is evident in its name, and that is to improve the knowledge of non-geriatricians in the care of the elderly. So what can you suggest that health professionals ought to know about Alzheimer's disease? Where are the gaps? So one of the things that uh, to me has been very interesting to learn when I talk to people, uh, we do something that is called care consultations where people will come and ask us questions, how to go about resources, what to do next. And I usually ask them, so when you went to see your doctor, what did the doctor say? And usually it says, I'm getting older, that's when I'm forgetting stuff. And to me, that's a no answer. There should be no answer at all. I mean, because as we know, getting older and forgetting stuff is not a normal process of aging, right? So we tell people, I say, you know, have you looked for a second opinion and stuff like that? And, and that's when they usually come to us and start asking questions. So I would say to be more knowledgeable about how to become dementia friendly. So meaning that, you know, you understand that sometimes uh, several things can cause people to start forgetting having issues with memory. And the importance to be able to refer to someone, getting more education. Uh, we have something that is called the ECHO training that is specifically for clinicians that they will learn about all the different aspects of, you know, the diagnosis, how to go about referring and all these different things. And on top of that, what the Geriatric Workforce Enforcement is doing by getting all these partners together, we can learn from each other on how to be more dementia friendly and also how to better offer assistance to people that are coming to actually seeking for a diagnosis or for, for help. Are there resources that healthcare professionals, physicians can access? Yes, like I was mentioning, there's the, the ECHO. I can provide you the information. Uh, people will go, they can register and uh, start doing the, these are live trainings and uh, live clinical studies. Are these online programs? Correct. Or? Excellent, excellent. Joe, where can our audience go for more information regarding resources on this topic? So one of the things that I will say is that for people to call our toll-free number, that's a 24-7 line that is open, is 1-800-272-3900. Whomever the calls, whatever the question is, they will be talking to a master level clinician and they can talk about all different type of issues. When it comes to caregivers, we have something that is called the Caregiver College. It's a series of educational programs specifically geared toward caregivers, and they can find that on alz.org. And there is also our community resource finder. And this uh, website is beautiful because if someone is looking for any type of services within their area, they can type the zip code and whether they want to search 5, 10 to 15 to 500 miles and they're looking for specifics. Like they're looking for an elderly law attorney, for living assistance facilities, for um, respite care, all these different things. They can go also to alc.org forward slash crf. All that's information and then on top of that, when people go to alc.org, they can find topics about everything that is related to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, as well as resources. Joe, I've heard of the Caregiver College. What type of an education 
can a caregiver obtain as a student at that college? So as I always say, when it comes to dementia, caregiving, knowledge is power, right? So in this particular series, um, people that can be either interactive in person or online, they will learn about behaviors, how to be prepared for the road ahead when behaviors are changing. Also, when people are, some of the patients will start with the wondering what steps to take to have a safe house, make sure that, you know, your loved one is protected if the disease takes the part where they start wondering. Another part is how to deal with the stress as a caregiver, because the one thing that we always mention, if you don't take care of yourself, you don't want to be able to take care of a family member experiencing the disease. And this is, in general, it's not a specific for Alzheimer's, but we have for all other type of dementia. Like people can actually start talking about this. So, very important. And these programs are available on demand, and they can be either in English or Spanish. Excellent. Joe, do you have any special advice that you'd like to offer to Alzheimer caregivers? Yes. Number one is that don't forget that you're not alone in this fight. The Alzheimer's Association is here to help and to never give up and always remember that, you know, when you experience even the person that you're taking care of might become violent or irritable and most of the time will accuse the loved one or abuse the loved one. Always remember that deep down inside, the person that you love is there, it's just that the mind is not working properly. So to keep that in mind and to always remember that we are always a phone call away to provide resources and anything that you need in this process. Can the Alzheimer's Association direct caregivers to any type of respite resources? Absolutely, yes. When they call, depending on the area where they live, they can actually ask for those specific resources. And as I mentioned before, through the Community Resource Finder, they can find all these different places. They can even uh, classify them by what type of insurance did they take, if they're taking new clients, and all these different things. As some of these organizations might even do a pro bono, depending on the circumstances of the person. So tell us, in terms of research, clinical care, or education, um, if you had one area where you would most like to see advances made, do you have one area that you think is truly in the greatest need? I will say you know, the greatest need is to actually find a cure. So that's why we are so concentrated in research, trying to look for new ways of diagnosing dementia or, or Alzheimer's disease through biomarkers. We have seen some advances in that research. But for me, like one of the things that I would really love to see within my lifetime is actually being able to see a cure. So that's the one thing that I will continuously talk about, you know, the research that is going on, the advances that are being done in the science of uh, Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, and uh, just to keep uh, bringing awareness into the communities because that's very important. Joe, it certainly sounds like your efforts are definitely moving the ball. Thank you for joining us today and sharing your expertise with our audience. It has been a pleasure discussing Alzheimer's with you. Everyone, please stay tuned for upcoming topics um, from our renowned subject matter experts.